What I've got here is a 2015-2016 BMW S1000RR. Back in December 2015, I paid $35,000 Australian for this bike. So we bought the motorcycle and then we tipped ticked every upgrade option that they offered and uh, you know it turned out to be a pretty special bike. Now a project that we've been uh, that we've kicked off and I've always wanted to do this and that is to complete the superbike build by upgrading the suspension into a high-end race suspension and uh, we chose by Tubo to do that. Now the obvious question is why would you get a $35,000 motorcycle which is obviously going to have pretty good uh, suspension fitted to it from the factory and then spend money to upgrade it to a high-end race suspension like the Bituba one that we've got here and uh, I wanted to get the answer to that question from the people who know more about this than I do so I went down to the Gold Coast I spent a day with Joe Salter from Ride Dynamics and uh, I threw that question out and uh, this video is about his answer to that Uh, it just depends, obviously, on, on what you're trying to get out of the bike. Yeah. Uh, so these DDCs are, are quite amazing in the ability to, to adapt to what you're doing, but they're never perfect. Yeah. They're, they're never. They're always based on an algorithm from the factory, and they may test these things in nice, beautiful roads in Germany, and we have some quite crap roads. So sometimes they can leave a little bit to be desired. Mm -hmm. Other times they. Uh, they fall too far outside of, of the intention of use that you want. So say you're, you know, you're a 130 kilo person, you need to have heavier springs, but then yeah. when you add much heavier springs, you start to lose dampening control or rebound control over the system. These, these things you can't revalve very very easily at all. They don't yeah. respond to things. They've got a solid piston with some holes in it. So unless you're keen to drill some holes in them, you're not really going to change this performance or behavior too well. Um, so that could be a reason. Other reason is basically manufacturing tolerances. There's always a, a tolerance to be had on the production line that is unsupervised almost. Yeah. So there's always a chance of, of bleed, of, of hydraulic fluid going this side or that side of the piston and then you have no control at that point. Yeah. Whereas when you run an aftermarket system, um, everything is built to much finer tolerance. Yeah. So Well, that's all they do basically. Correct, that's right. And they usually are all hand built. So there's always a pair of eyes and a pair of hands running over every component along the way. And so they can pick up things, um, but also keep checking for things along the way and make sure it's as best as it can be. Um, also, manufacturers are trying to basically make one thing do everything. And when, you, when you're trying to chase one thing, it makes nothing, nothing's ever achieved. It's always just a compromise in every possible way. Yeah. So when you go to this sort of system, you're able to, to build a specific system to, to you. You know, springs to suit your weight, valving to suit you, change air gaps to suit how aggressively you brake and so forth. We can do it a lot more with an aftermarket system than we can with OEM. So that's the main why you would do so. Um, OEM, say like a, a CR300 Honda, uh, they have no damping pretty much, almost non existent. So you need to then bring it in and do something with it to get some control over the bike because for whatever reason, someone in Honda said it's a good system, let's run with that. What would someone like me, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm in, the, in this 80 to 85 kilo yeah. range and I believe the standard system is built for that type Correct. of weight. It is. What, what type of things would I expect to feel going from a factory one to a by two bow system I'm going to put in here? Sure, now? yep. So the main benefit you will feel is two, twofold. Stability, better uh, consistent dampening control. Yeah. Uh, which then translates you to a more stable motorcycle. So the, the hysteresis or oscillation that the bike can freely move on is, is drastically cut. Yeah. Um, the second one is compliance. We're able then, because we can control the smaller motions better, we're then able to have a, a more open circuit on the higher speed impacts, which means the bike is more stable, but softer at the same time. Right. Uh, whereas OEMs, you're trying to find this balance so the lower speed stuff can be a bit sloppy. Yeah. Uh, so then you add dampening to it. But then what happens is when you then go get a bump, you've got too much dampening going on for that circuit. So this allows you a much better range. Um, for a simple example, I know we're doing four right now, but these give you adjustments of high and low speed compression, yeah. high and low speed rebound. Yeah. Your standard shocks don't give you that. So that's why we're able to get the tailor much better. Right. Are you, when you're talking about high speed and low speed, 
talking about the rate of oscillation. The real fast oscillation is the high speed. Yes. Yes. And so the slow oscillation, the big bumps. Yep. Yeah. Right. So you can imagine hitting this. Yeah. That's a fifty mil square edge lip. Yeah. That suspension, that wheel has to travel vertically, 50 millimeters, almost instantaneously. Yeah. That's a very fast motion to the suspension. So that's your high speed movement. Yeah. And then if you had a, a depression in the road that's long, and the box will roll in and out of it, that's a very low that's speed movement to it. And even uh, like a speed bump that's very long, the bike has time to go up and over it. So the, the damping speed or the shaft speed of the shock will, will fall because it's a lot slower. Yeah, you gotcha.